Okay, welcome back to another uh, Year 12 Biology Revision lesson. Today we're going to look at genetic diversity and uh, first of all we need to understand what it means by genetic diversity. We're also going to look at mutations, the process of meiosis and how that leads to more genetic variation. Uh, we're going to look at natural selection and types of selection that are involved there. So there's a nice little overview of what this lesson is going to contain. So we'll start off by talking about what genetic diversity actually means. Genetic diversity is the measure of the range of alleles within a population. So let's actually recap that as well. What does allele mean? Well, allele is a version of a gene, a type of a gene. Um, so the more alleles that are present in a population, we would say that it is more genetically diverse. Populations that have fewer range of alleles, a more limited gene pool, if you will, will have lower levels of genetic diversity. And genetic diversity is essential because it's what natural selection acts upon. And if you are missing key alleles that might aid you in survival, then your population might be in serious trouble and it might even potentially become extinct. So it having higher genetic diversity is very important, increases your survival chances because you've kind of almost got those you might potentially have alleles in the cupboard, if you like, within your population that might make you able to survive. So what we need to now look at is how we get genetic variation. Where do these new alleles come from? And that is from mutations, which is our next part of our video that we're going to look at. OK, so well, let's look at mutations then. So I'm going to draw a very simplistic base sequence to help hopefully identify what is going on in the mutation. So I'm just going to draw um, three triplets within this base sequence. We'll assume that's the entire gene, but bear in mind there would be significantly more uh, base sequences than that. So I like to do this one because it, you can kind of see the words uh, quite easily. So I've got three separate codons there. All three of them are reading cat. And that obviously that codon would uh, code for a specific type of amino acid. So that's my normal base sequence. Um, and that is obviously uh, within a gene to code for a specific protein that has a particular function within my cells. Now, if a mutation occurs, we will change this base sequence. That's what a gene mutation is, a change in the, the number or sequence of that base sequence within our genes. So the first type of mutation that could occur is called a substitution mutation. So again, I'll write that new base sequence out. And this time I'm going to change that second base in that first codon. I'm going to change it to uh, another cytosine. So we can see in a substitution mutation, I still have those three codons there of course, but this is the only codon that is affected. This, was, this is where that mutation occurred. Okay, so I've changed in a substitution mutation. I'm changing one base for another, and that therefore the knock-on effect is that that will change what amino acid will be in our primary uh, primary structure of our uh, of our protein that we're going to build. But it only affects one of them. It won't affect the others in the sequence. So substitution mutations often have possibly more limited effects because they're only affecting one amino acid and we're going to see with the other two types with deletion or insertion that we can have much more profound changes to our base sequences. So I'll look at those two next. So let's get rid of the substitution mutation to start off with. Okay, so now let's look at uh, a deletion mutation. This is where we've deleted one or more uh, bases from our sequence. And again, I'm going to affect that, that second um, nucleotide in our sequence, that second base, and uh, see what happens. What would it be? If it was cat again, it would be C again. Okay, so this time I've got rid of that, that A there, that is where my deletion has taken place. And you can see it's affected that codon, but it's affected all the others within the sequence, and in fact it would have a knock-on effect all the way along that base sequence. We call that a frame shift. I've shifted everything along. Uh, or in this case back by one. Uh, and that can have a very catastrophic effect on that protein's functionality because not only have I affected one codon, I've affected all of them. So therefore I'm going to end up with a potentially a very, very different base sequence and therefore a very, very different 
uh, primary structure of my protein that's probably not going to be functional. Um, we would see a similar thing with an insertion. Uh, in this case, I'm adding in an extra uh, base. So let's say I'm adding in an extra adenine. Okay, so do it again to keep it consistent. We'll have it going in as a second nucleotide. So I've got an extra one there. So that's that first code on there. And we can see here, again, this is also caused a frame shift as well. The only difference obviously between a deletion and insertion is in deletion I'm removing one, uh, moving one base and um, with an insertion I'm adding one. But they both have very profound effects. So mutations can... Um, be good, they can be bad, they can be neutral, depending on what effect they have on the protein uh, that the DNA base sequence codes for. So we'll start off with neutrality. So often many mutations will actually have no effect at all on our protein structure. Well, how is that possible? Well, the first reason is because the degenerate nature of the genetic code. We might find that substituting one codon for another actually will have no effect on the amino acid coded for because those two codons happen to code for the same amino acid. Or if I do end up changing the amino acid, it could be that that amino acid is not important within the structure of the protein. It doesn't have any important bonding which would affect the shape of how that protein would work. So often we find that mutations are neutral, they're silent, they don't have a measurable effect on the phenotype of the organism. Um, more often than not, if they're not neutral, they tend to be negative. They're going to reduce the efficiency or even the functionality of a protein such as an enzyme. Um, many people have gene mutations that mean that certain enzymes in their body don't work and it has tremendously negative health impacts on their lives. Um, so often mutations are quite negative. Occasionally, they can be positive. They can actually increase the chances of survival of an organism that has this mutation. So if, for example, it could maybe have changed the active site shape in such a way that it means it forms enzyme substrates complexes more easily, therefore making the enzyme more efficient. It might result in certain proteins being formed that maybe give the organism a different colour, which might aid in camouflage or something like that. So mutations can be beneficial, but they're always random. There's no set pattern as to when or how they're going to occur. They are completely random. They're caused by uh, a wide variety of things, some of them environmental Environmental, like ionizing radiation, or they may occur during DNA replication when the DNA is being replicated. It's possible that a substitution, a deletion, or an insertion could take place. So they're all examples of gene mutations, but they're not the only types of mutation that we can have. We can also have chromosomal mutations. This is where we are changing the number or quantity of the chromosomes that are in our gametes are, are sex cells. So we can end up either maybe potentially doubling up our number of chromosomes if they don't separate in uh, meiosis, we call that non-disjunction, or we, actually, well, maybe not all of them, but maybe one in humans. So you may have been familiar with something like Down syndrome, it's where we have an, a person who has Downs has an extra chromosome. I believe it's chromosome 13. I, maybe you can tell me in the comments, I can't remember off the top of my head. So they've inherited an extra chromosome. Um, now, in animals, that tends to be quite negative to have uh, extra or fewer chromosomes. Um, in plants, they can seem to cope with this quite well, actually. Uh, and in many cases, some plants can be what's called polyploidy. They can have many, many sets of chromosomes. I'm aware of a particular fern species that I believe has over 100 sets of chromosomes. You and I are diploid. We have two sets, as do the majority of animals on this planet have just two sets. Um, in this case, this plant has over 100, which is quite remarkable. And we've actually been able to exploit this uh, to create modern hybrids of wheat. So we've used a combination of polyploidy happening, so chromosomal mutations, but also hybridizing two species together to give us uh, a, a range of uh, chromosomes from different species. And that's where our modern wheat comes from, for a combination of um, polyploidy as a result of chromosome mutations and hybridization events between different grass species. So that's an overview of mutations and these are the primary way that we can get genetic variation in the first place. This provides us with new alleles to begin with. But there's another process that really ups the level of variation within the organisms and that is meiosis which we'll look at next.
So meiosis is another form of nuclear division. So we've looked at mitosis in uh, previous lessons and we've seen how that can create two genetically identical daughter cells, each with two sets of chromosomes. Meiosis is another method by which our cells can divide at their nucleus, but it's going to end up with haploid cells. So cells, daughter cells that have one set of chromosomes. And also each of those daughter cells are going to show significant levels of genetic variation. So meiosis is a more complex process and it's going to take some time for me to go through uh, and break it down. So feel free to pause at any point uh, to take some notes and uh, get your head around it. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to draw a little diagram of what is going on in meiosis uh, and then I'm going to talk about at each stage what's going on. Okay. So what I've done is my whiteboard's not as big as perhaps I would like and not one I'm used to at school. I've had to sort of break it down, but that serves their purpose as well because meiosis really is split into two rounds, what we call meiosis one and meiosis two, because there's two rounds of division, which is another key difference with mitosis. We've only got one round of division. So what's going on in meiosis one? So here's what the cell would look like in, well, at least maybe where the nucleus would have been, in prophase. So I've now got visible chromosomes, so identical sister chromatids joined together at the centromere, like as described within the mitosis video. Um, and what I've drawn this time is I've drawn two sets of chromosomes. And now let's pretend uh, the dark ones are paternal, so i.e. from your father, and let's say the white ones are from your mother. And you can see that actually I've sort of drawn them paired up. At this point they would be kind of randomly orientated. But you've got two sets of chromosomes, one you've inherited from your mum, one you've inherited from your dad, and you've got one of each type of chromosome. Okay, so in humans we have 23 types of chromosomes, two of each. So it's like having two sets of encyclopedias, effectively. So what happens? So the most important part of meiosis one, or it's the most important bit to start off with, is what's going on in metaphase one. So here, the chromosomes have actually, instead of lining up along the equator like they did in mitosis, they've paired up. They form what we call bivalence or homologous pairs, either way is fine to describe it. So this is like chromosome type 1 and this is chromosome type 2. So this is where we can start getting some variation into the mix, some genetic variation. Now they form these homologous pairs randomly. Okay, so we call that independent segregation. So in this case, I've drawn the, the black one there and the white one there, but they could have been swapped around. They could have happened to pair up that way. It's completely random. And likewise, my longer pair here, I've got the white one on top and the black one on the bottom. They've done so randomly. Now, in the case of humans, this obviously would extend to 23 along there. And there's enormous, I mean, huge, um, you know, it's well into the millions, of ways that I could... Uh, independently segregate human chromosomes. So that already starts to increase our genetic diversity quite significantly. Over here, I've also drawn another process that's going on. This is called crossing over, or chiasmata. And it's where equivalent portions of chromosomes on a homologous pair, so these two uh, chromatids here, have started to overlap okay, and wrap around each other. And they're going to swap equivalent portions at the same locus, that's position on the chromosome where a particular gene is. And we'll end up with um, new, unique chromosomal combinations. So if I actually show you the outcome here, so I've drawn it here, we'd actually have a black tip on the base of that particular chromosome there, and I would have a white tip on the base of that chromosome there, or at least on those particular chromatids. The, the chromosomes are then separated by spindle fibers in anaphase they'd be moving up i haven't drawn that there but that's what would happen and by telophase i would have these two separate nuclei and i've actually only got now half the number of chromosomes that i started with but they're still whole chromosomes so we've now got to move into meiosis 2 where we end up forming our gametes our sex cells okay so we'll look at meiosis 2 now so we can see here were the daughter cells that i had um, from the first round of division we would see all the same features that we'd see we'd see that p mat like we would in meiosis but with number twos in front of it so prophase 2 metaphase 2 etc so i haven't drawn those but what would happen uh, to end up with what I've got down here at the bottom is our chromosomes would be arranged along the equator of the cell. This time uh, they are actually separated, pulled apart into their sister chromatids and we'd end up with uh, a daughter cell that would then uh, divide and we end up with actually four daughter cells formed, each of which is haploid, so it's only got one set of chromosome. 
uh, compared to its original parent cell, which was diploid. And we can see that all of them are different. They show genetic variation. So in humans, we can end up with a really like huge number uh, of potential chromosome uh, combinations. Just let me think about how many that would be. So to work out the number of possible chromosomal combinations that you can get, you would just do two to the power of the number of pairs. Now in humans, we have 23 pairs. You then would square it if you're working out uh, it fertilization, so where two random gametes from two individuals would join. And you end up with a really massive figure, 8,324,608 possible combinations of gametes fusing between two individuals. And this explains why um, we we see such huge variation between our siblings, assuming you're not, uh, you know, you're not genetically identical if you're um, an identical twin. There is just a huge amount of variation we can get from meiosis and then through uh, gametes fusing during sexual reproduction. So meiosis is really essential for that. So organisms that are sexually reproducing, like most animals and plants, we can introduce enormous amounts of variation in our offspring which then might give them adaptive advantages in a changing environment because natural selection can act upon certain alleles that may be beneficial. If you're asexual, you don't have this process. So all of your genetic information is uh, been passed down to your offspring. Now that's great if you live in a stable environment, but if your environment's unstable and changing, if you lack, and therefore all of your offspring, lack any advantageous alleles, you're not maybe able to introduce them uh, as readily. Um, and that's one of the major advantages of sexual reproduction. It gives you that much more genetic variation in the offspring. So there's a really good look. We've had a good look at mutations and meiosis as sources of genetic variation. Now let's look at the process which acts upon it. And it's my favorite, natural selection. So let's now look at natural selection, the process by which um, evolution occurs. So evolution is, where you've got any kind of perceived change in the in the gene or allele frequency of a population over time. So Charles Darwin was the guy who came up, and along with Alfred Russell Wallace, came up with the theory of natural selection, the mechanism that can cause a change in a species over time. And it underpins everything in biology, every, every process, everything makes sense in the light of evolution and natural selection. Because, of course, natural selection acts upon our alleles, our DNA, our genes. It affects the biological molecules, the proteins that make us work. That affects the cells, the tissues, the organs that make up our bodies. It affects us as an organism and how we, um, how we can survive and interact with our environment, our ecology, if you like. So it runs through every single aspect of biology. So it's a really, really important process. And we need to understand how natural selection works. Unfortunately, I think natural selection as a process is incredibly simple. Um, we have to start off with variation in our population, and that variation may be already pre-existing, you know, a, a range of alleles, or potentially I might have had a mutation that's given me a new allele. So we'll start with that angle there. Let's assume we've had a new mutation in our population. Okay. Now, what will determine whether that mutation, that allele, that has been formed from that mutation is beneficial or negative will come, will come down to our selection pressures. And it's important that you identify what your selection pressure is in the given scenario you've got in an exam question or an activity or whatever. Um, it might be something biotic like predation or a pathogen or it might be abiotic so a non-living factor like temperature or pH of the water whatever it may be but any kind of ecological abiotic or biotic factor could well be a selection pressure and in fact for most organisms it's going to be a whole range of these selection pressures that will determine whether you live or die so let's assume that this new allele that we've got is actually a beneficial allele okay so I would call that BA if you like so our BA, beneficial allele organisms, are much more likely to survive, whereas our ones with our negative allele are more likely to die. So we've already kind of got this filtering process, separating out the ones that are more likely to survive and the ones that aren't. This is you know, Darwin's idea of survival of the fittest. These are the, su the better survivors. But also we're updating it in modern times by talking about alleles, which he was unaware of at the time. So if you're more likely to survive, 
there's a greater chance that you can then reproduce. And if you reproduce, you can pass on that allele to your offspring. Okay, And over time, through many, many generations of this cycle going round and round and round again, we will actually see a change in the allele frequency. And that's an important point to put in your exam questions. We're going to see a change in allele frequency. Okay, So now we're seeing evolution happen, aren't we? Because we're seeing a change in the allele frequency of our population. And this can be used to explain you know, any number of things. You know, any kind of uh, adaptation that we see in any organism has come about through this process. The classic one, of course, is the peppered moth, which was carried out a long time ago. And what they noted was that in industrial areas, in the Industrial Revolution, that the peppered moths, the white standard black and white form, was becoming more scarce, whereas the black melanistic form was becoming more common. Okay? And in fact, we saw within one generation, the scientists at the time were studying this, within one generation, over 90% of the population had become black. It's not because they were mutating to suit their environment. That's not how mutations work. It's merely that we're having random mutations that gave some individuals this melanistic property, i.e. having black wings, that enabled them to be better adapted to their environment because predators were less likely to spot them. These black individuals were therefore more likely to survive. They were more likely to reproduce, pass on that alleles to their offspring. And over time, in this case just a year, we did see this change in allele frequencies. Now as the Clean Air Act came into force and we started burning uh, our coal and, and so forth um, more cleanly, we actually saw this flip back the other way and that the white moths, the peppered, the standard black and white form, returned because they were now better camouflage, predators were far less likely to spot them because the trees weren't black anymore and our black moths stood out like a sore thumb and they were being preferentially eaten and therefore we saw this change, this flip back of our allele frequency. So that's a nice little overview of natural selection. I highly recommend that you um, go ahead and research other examples of natural selection in, in action. It's a good one maybe you could pepper into an exam question, an essay question, sorry, uh, if ever something like that came up. So it's just good to have that in your general knowledge. So now we'll look at our types of selection um, and what's going on there, okay? Cheeky tea break, <laughs> much better, much better. All right, and types of selection then. So before we kind of start to look at the two main types we're going to look at for AS, we've got to look at this idea of what a normal distribution is. So if you've got a particular character trait, usually a continuous variable, um, which means that, you know, something like height or body mass or something like that, where you've got a wide range of intermediate values, they're not, not categorical data in other words, you'll see generally a normal distribution pattern. So you'll see a graph that will, that's a classic kind of bell curve, where the majority of the individuals are in the population are within the mean, and we've got fewer numbers of individuals at the extreme. So this is a normal distribution curve. And we would see continuous traits like this are usually associated with polygenic characteristics. So what do I mean by that? These are characteristics that are controlled by multiple genes. Now, if a characteristic is controlled by a one gene, then we tend to find that we don't get this continuous variation. We would see more discontinuous, more categoric variation. Um, you may have noticed this for ladybirds. So if you've ever gone out in the garden and you've seen your classic seven spotted ladybird, which is you know, orangey red with seven black spots, you might have also seen ones about the same size that are black with red spots on them. And you thought, oh, that's a different species of ladybird. In fact, that's probably not. They're probably the same species of ladybird. But what you're seeing is um, differences in alleles. Okay? And because it's controlled, that wing colour, that's uh, that, yeah, the outer casing, the electra, is controlled by one gene, we're going to usually get discontinuous variation because of, if I change the allele here or change the allele there, I'm going to get different characteristics. So we're going to mainly refer to continuous variation and, and traits that are continuous. So this is our normal distribution curve. Now selection is going to change the shape of this curve because certain individuals are selected for, like we saw earlier in the video, beneficial alleles, and negative alleles are going to be selected against. So with types of selection, there's two ways we can change this um, 
distribution. And that is through, first of all, stabilizing selection, but then also we've got this idea of directional selection. So let's start off with, uh, with stabilizing selection to begin with. So stabilizing selection is where we are selecting for the mean individuals, the most common individuals in our population. They're selected for, and the two extremes are selected against. So what we would see is that that normal distribution pattern is going to change. It's going to get smaller. We're going to have less variation within the mean. It's going to become a lot narrower, a lot tighter, like that. So we've still got a normal distribution pattern, but it's much more constricted. Uh, and this is we would see stabilizing selection when the environment is stable. There isn't any change. And therefore, if you've got alleles that are beneficial to that particular environmental state, which most individuals will have inherited, you're the ones that are going to survive. If you've got some more extreme alleles and extreme variation, you're probably not likely to do as well. So that's an example of stabilizing selection. But when we look at directional selection, we're going to see how that differs. Okay, so now we're going to look at that directional selection. So in directional selection, again, I'll start off with that same normal distribution curve I had before, but this time, I'm selecting for one extreme and I'm selecting against the mean and the other extreme and that's the best way of describing these things. Always state what part of the curve is selected for and what part of the curve is selected against. So what we would see is we would see the shifting of our normal distribution that way. So now my extreme individuals are the ones that are going to survive. So Let's go back to our ladybird example. So I mentioned that you can get the orange and the black ladybirds, and they're still the same species, and that we find that the orange form is more common in many parts of the country. Um, but let's say the environment's changed. Let's go maybe everything's got really polluted, and those black ones might be, you know, better camouflaged, potentially. Um, I know that ladybirds and that orange colour is a warning coloration, um, so they want to stand out. But let's just assume that it's you know, to help them blend into their environment. The black ones are going to do better, and that's where we would see that directional change. Another really good example where I think about it, about directional selection, is the development of antibiotic resistance in bacteria. So imagine you're one bacteria, you've had a random mutation that means that you've now got an allele that means you're resistant to antibiotics, whereas the rest of the population that you're living amongst isn't resistant. Now that, you're going to see massive directional selection here in, in this example. So the, the resistant form is going to survive in the presence of antibiotics, which is the selection pressure, whereas all the non-resistant ones are going to die off. So very quickly, the population is going to be, it's going to be changed. So that resistant one has no longer got any competition. We've got rid of all of um, the non-resistant forms. There's plenty of food. And, uh, and other resources for that resistant bacteria. So it's going to reproduce very rapidly. It's going to pass on that resistance gene, allele, sorry, to its offspring, and very quickly the frequency of the population changes. And that would be a really good example of directional selection there. So there's a nice little overview. There is another type of selection um, that I might mention now because I think it fits. But this one you would see more coming up in year 13. And this is called disruptive. Um, selection. So in disruptive selection, we'll go back to my normal distribution curve there, what we're going to see here is that the two extremes are selected for and the mean is selected against. And what you'll actually end up with is a very unusual curve. It's going to have a kind of a bimodal distribution like that, two peaks. And our mean individuals here are, are selected against. So we're seeing kind of directional selection, but in, in two different directions. Um, and this one, disruptive selection, is very important in the process of speciation, i.e. the formation of new species. Uh, and actually will cause these two populations to potentially diverge. And over time and through selection, they're going to end up becoming two separate species. Okay, So that's a nice little overview of our genetics topic. Uh, genetic diversity topic, sorry. Um, so this is Dr. P signing off. Stay safe, stay indoors. Have a good one. Cheerio.